we're having a webinar on alternatives to neonicotinoid insecticides. So some people call it neonicotinoids, neon, neonics, neonics, whatever you want to say, all good. So the, as a quick overview, we're going to talk briefly about the levy funded project under which this webinar is run. We'll talk about the impact of neonics and to a lesser extent, broad spectrum insecticides, alternative low risk pesticides, and then methods to reduce pesticide usage generally. All right. So you can read the title of the project that this webinar has come under. It's not just webinars. We are producing a lot of fact sheets. One big area of the project is the diagnostics. So growers send us sick plants. We run tests. We work out what's wrong with them, what's not wrong with them, and send a report with the findings and some recommendations on how to deal with that. So we're running webinars and workshops. We had run a, a workshop in each state and territory of the project each year of the project, which was 2016. And this is the final year. And for uh, pandemic reasons, we're just running webinars this year. We we'll also have an, uh, uh, an aspect of biosecurity support for the nursery industry. And I apologize, I should really have that N removed. It should be GIA newsletter. My apologies there. And if you haven't been to the Nursery Production FMS website, it is great. It has so many resources. I'm constantly saying that the nursery industry in Australia is one of the the best in terms of the accreditation and the resources that are available to you. So you don't need to remake the wheel. And we'll talk about some of those pest management plans and nursery papers and fact sheets that are available through the workshop. Okay, so we'll get back and get straight into the impact of neonicotinoids. Now, there's just a little lag time between when I hit the button and when it pops up for you. So, um, all right. So when we're talking about insecticides, it's worth realizing that insecticides, it seems obvious, but they are designed to kill insects and, and mites. They kill mites as well, but caricides, it's easy to just say insecticides for both of those groups. So the focus is on killing pests. Because it is a poison for insects, it does have an impact on the beneficial species and of the predators, parasites, and pollinators. And these impacts can be outright death, or maybe it doesn't actually kill the insect, but it can reduce the egg laying ability or reduce the lifespan of those insects that have receive the dose or reduce the feeding ability. And so if you're dealing with a, a predator that's not feeding as much, obviously that's bad. Reduced vigor generally, so maybe they don't move around as much or other aspects of behavior that simply make those predators or parasites less effective. They may be less able to overcome some other source of stress, that sort of thing. So insecticides, an insect can come in contact with an insecticide in various different ways. The most obvious is when it's applied to plants, it's obviously, well, hopefully it encounters the insecticide. That's the idea. You get good coverage. The insects that are present are, um, receive a dose and hopefully a lethal dose for the pest. And then also they can receive, they can come in contact with that insecticide after application. So at application on the plant, as we've said, it's also drifts. If there's any drift to out nearby areas, that can be a direct contact with the product. John, would you mind just uh, putting yourself on mute? Sorry about that. <laughs> Getting a little bit of... Um... Andrew, can you hear me? Yeah, I can hear Andrew? you, John. Ah, can you not hear me? Um, um, 
Is, I just want to check, is anyone else having difficulty hearing Andrew? Because he keeps sort of cutting in and out on my end. Um, if you, so if you're not having, or if you are having issues, can you just raise your hand? Uh, maybe it's no just me hands. then. That's right. No, no, just you, John. Yeah, you that's, just keep cutting in and out. That's a good thing to check. It. Yeah. All right. So if you, we'll just change that around. That's if right. you're having no, no problems. Problem. Yep. If you're having no problems hearing me, can you just raise your hand for me, please? Yep. Got a few hand raises there. That's great. Oh, almost everyone. That's great. Thanks, yeah, everyone. I'll just lower your hands. Perfect. All right. Thanks no, for checking, John. My connection. So I'll just have to persevere with it. <laughs> Perfect. <laughs> no worries, ever. Okay, great. Uh, now, where we, we, we had just talked about drift. Right. So then also the, the, the pesticide can go into the soil or the growing media and uh, into the surrounding sort of non-growing areas. It's just waiting for the next screen to pop up. Here we go. Oh, yep. Okay, so post application, there can be potentially a lot of ways that insecticides can move around and for insects to encounter the pesticide. They can be from eating the plant. So that can be for contact and systemic products. It can be covering the plant. It can be within the plant. They eat the plant. They can encounter that insecticide. Some insecticides which are uh, systemic, it can go into the pollen or the nectar. They can in co contact from just simply walking on the plant and picking up small amounts of the product. And some products are more effective at killing insects in that way than others. It can be from walking around the growing area. So let's say, in, particularly on plastic in the insides of polytunnels, if they're walking around and they're encountering, they can pick up those pesticides and have it affect them. It can go into water. Obviously, the more water soluble it is, the more likely it is to be present in the water. Also, Organisms that eat the insects that have been exposed to the product can encounter that insecticide. And that can then go on in the food chain. Now, some products persist for long periods of time, others shorter periods of time. So that can then also affect how that pest or beneficial insect encounters the product or, or the length of time. Okay, so now specifically for neonicotinoids or neonics, it is a highly water soluble product. They are upward systemic products. So if you apply it to the foliage, they move up the foliage. If you apply it to the growing media or the soil, it moves, it's taken up by the roots with water and is trans transferred up the plant. It, yeah, as I said, it was into the pollen and the nectar, and, and the studies have shown that it's much high, in much higher concentrations than the pollen relative to nectar. However, it is also found in in nectar, and then obviously then it can be encountered in honey. So there was a study not that long ago that sampled 200, nearly 200 honey samples from around the world and they were able to detect neonicotinoids, at least one product or uh, active ingredient in 75% of the honey. Now, all of the samples were at levels below that, um, uh, so it was under the, the health, human health safety standard uh, levels. However, it was still there in trace amounts. In an agricultural setting, um, the many seeds are coated or used to be. One of the uses of neonicotinoid products is as dust coating seed. So the tractors that then drill, direct drill the seed into the soil in agricultural settings, that dust can be blown into surrounding areas. And that was one of the ways that 
we're fi finding it in um, the, the the surrounding agricultural areas or non-agricultural areas, and then being going into the environment. So it can get into the adjacent plants at significant rates just from drift, from from drift. Then also through waterways and in snow melts. In when the snow melts, the studies show that in snow melts near agricultural areas, obviously in northern hemisphere. Uh, in Northern Hemisphere sort of situation, you get higher amounts of these neonicotinoids, but even in snow melts where they have not, where they aren't adjacent to agricultural areas, they're able to detect these uh, active ingredients in trace amounts. These products are moving around whether we like it or not. Um, and the different products have different levels of persistence depending on the environmental conditions at the time. Now, I'm not going to, I'm not an expert in this. I researched this for this webinar, and there is a mountain of research on neonicotinoids. It's quite, it's quite substantial. So we will be sending out a few of the rev recent reviews where you can look at the information in more detail than we can really cover at this webinar. Because if you were going to summarize it in detail, we could probably spend a whole hour just on neonicotinoids in, in the environment. That's not the point of this webinar so much. But we will cover something. So the effect on bees, hive, hives exposed to the dust can be killed outright. So this is a tractor direct drilling seed, dust can move from the tractor past the hive and can basically, it can wipe out. Apis mellifera, which is the honeybee, is relatively sensitive to neonicotinoids. Some other bees and bumblebees are less sensitive, so relatively, so it's all relative. So there are, there are different species can have different uh, doses and have different effects. But the studies indicate that low dose exposure that doesn't just kill bees outright can cause experimentally, they've shown that it can cause reduced reproductive ability. So the queen's not able to produce as many bees as ones that haven't been exposed or the workers are, have a reduced pollen collection rate, or there's increased stress on the hive. So the, maybe they'll find that fewer workers get back to the hive. So the queen tries to compensate by producing workers, or, or relatively more workers than those that, um, that aren't exposed, and that does sort of conflict with this reproduce, reduced reproductive ability, but it, it, these studies are interesting, and it's quite complicated how these things are done. Um, and it, in any case, these are affected by these products when they are exposed at low doses, and the best studies are the ones that expose bees at rates that are consistent with environmental exposure. So um, it's, it's, I'm convinced based on my reading that it is a real thing. Bees can be negatively affected and there is a correlation between a reduction in wild bee populations and an increase in the use of these pesticides. It's not always straightforward, as there can be other factors that are also correlated with wild bee population and other population uh, reductions. So for instance, there's studies on, on butterfly diversity, and it could be because of pesticides, or it could be because of habitat loss, and a general agricultural intensity, intensification. So it's not just one factor, and that's part of the reason that these studies can be quite difficult to interpret. 
um, but it's something that we shouldn't ignore. There are many aquatic invertebrates at risk, and while fish aren't directly impacted, it can potentially have an impact from um, reductions in aquatic invertebrate populations. There have been studies on grain feeding birds that feed on seeds that have been coated in neonicotinoids and there's it can potentially cause bird death or a change a reduction in reproduction or neurobehavioral neuro problems from eating these seeds but with that said the effect on wild bird populations is unknown we, I might just stop there and say that neonicotinoids, the mode of action, it's a nerve poison. It is focused on a pathway that is generally, it's an insect related pathways in the nerves. So it tends to be insect specific and that's why it has a, a re reduced rate of impact in mammals and vertebrates compared to some other insecticides like your OPs, your organophosphates and whatnot. Okay, so we've, we've mentioned this briefly, the reductions in populations can have a flow on effect to the general environment. And ultimately the message I wanna give here is that the, the risks are potentially very high. It's something that I think shouldn't be ignored. And I think that the ban that has been placed in Europe has justification. I'd encourage you to read some of the literature, even if it's just some of the reviews. There are lots of studies out there that suggest that this is a good course of action. And regardless, even if you don't, be don't believe that, and that's, I'm, I'm not gonna say that that's wrong, what we have to deal with in Australia is that some retailers are not accepting stock that have had plant, I've been had plants um, that have been a uh, sorry stocks that have had neonic supplied are not accepted so we still have to deal with that and there are ways that we can deal with that quite well so that's the main focus of the webinar okay do we have questions at this point so <clears throat> I guess Andrew one question I have for you is mm -hmm. What's the time frame of, yeah. say, non-target organisms shown an effect of the, um, being affected by uh, the neonicotinoids? I know it's going to vary from organism to organism, but yep. um, like, let's say, uh, your beneficial insects, what's the time frame that they'll start showing symptoms? To be honest, I don't know. I would guess it would be similar to other insecticides where if there's a low dose exposure, it might be an immediate effect that could last the rest of its life, or it might be the more that it encounters, then the, the increase that may then increase the, um, the effect. So I don't know the answer to that question, John. I'm sorry. So, yeah. so I, I guess it, yeah, in regards to predators, the more they eat, more insects they eat that have got a dose of that chemical in them, uh, perhaps the, the quicker they are going to suffer from that small dose that they intake themselves. So the yes, more they eat, the, more, the quicker their effect, I guess, would be the case. Yeah. Yes. Yep. Oh, we haven't got any other questions as yet, Andrew, so okay. may as well keep All right, we'll, on, we'll play on through. Great. And we're doing well with time. Okay, so we're going to talk about alternative pesticides that can be used. So I looked at, there are five neonicotinoids that are registered for use in nurseries, in production nurseries. And they're listed here on the left with all of the different insect groups that they're registered for. And on the right-hand side, I've just summarized them. And these therefore are the 
the groups that we're going to cover. Before we do that, we're going to do a little spiel on your IPM friendly or your low risk products, as that's important for understanding the slides that we're going to talk about in a minute. So your beneficials, they're your predators, parasites, pollinators. Low risk products tend to have a more limited impact on these populations. But as we said earlier, it's an insecticide. It's designed to kill insects. So I don't, if, if someone claims that they have an insecticide that has no non-target effects, I will be extraordinarily skeptical. It doesn't make sense unless it's so specific that it, it only affects one group of insects and that's because it's specifically designed. Um, anyway, they are generally short, they have a short residual impact. So the, the, the length of time that that product stays in the environment is relatively low maybe only while it's wet or maybe for a few days and then it, it's gone. And the sublethal impacts we've already talked about earlier, so we won't cover that again. What we want to highlight is that some low risk products are highly toxic to some beneficial insects. And the websites, um, so Copert and BioBest overseas have studied a lot of these things. And there have been some studies in Australia too, that are summarized in the That Good Bug book. Some, who knows about that? the Good Bug book, the green book? Um, as, if yep, there's a couple that have raised their hand, thank you. Uh, that summarizes some, and the biological control agent producers also have some information on their websites. You can look at, and we, Andrew, if we have time, um, we could, I guess yeah. one of the, Yes, John? Um, I guess one of the low risk um, insecticides would be things like your viruses, which can be very specific, yeah. um, designed specifically for a particular group of insects. Right. Yes, I was thinking about that as, when, as I said it. I, I, I was thinking about it. And even some of the BT products, there's, you know, they either are specific to caterpillars or to um, fly larvae. Anyway, uh, thanks, John. Okay, so no in comparison, sorry, was there something else? All right, I'll keep going. So in comparison to your low risk products, the broad spectrum products are ones that basically kill most predators and parasites, and they t may have a long residual period. All right. Other information that's included on the slides that we're about to have is of the contact, translaminar, and systemic. And some of these slides, if you've been to some of our workshops, you may recognize the slides. I have updated them. There were some slight changes from previous. Uh, so your contact ones, they're obviously those that are only cover the plant. They don't go into the plant. Your systemic products go into the plant and most products are upward systemic. Spirotetramat is one of the exceptions that it is also downward systemic. Translaminar, so trans is across, laminar is the leaf, so it goes from the top of the leaf. If, it, if the product hits the top of the leaf, it moves to the bottom of the leaf in that same area where it's contacted the leaf. Uh, or vice versa, from the bottom to the top, but it doesn't necessarily go from a distal part of the leaf to the basal part of the leaf, or from one leaf to another. And there is a level of a spectrum here, so, so translaminar can often be described as limited systemicity sort of thing, a limited systemic product. Our knowledge changes over time, so, and that's in that area of how systemic is a product in that area, as well as from a human safety perspective and in environmental safety knowledge changes, which is part of the reason why all this has come about. What we're gonna suggest is 
don't assume that an insecticide will solve your problem. If you've got a plant growth problem, confirm that you've got a pest present. Confirm what type of pest it is at the very least. And if you need to, find out what species it is where there's resistance issues. Let's say for thrips is a classic example where Western flower thrips is quite common. And then also so is onion thrips and different, they have different insecticide resistance issues. Also realize that insecticides can cause phytotoxicity and they can cause changes in growth that may not be recognized as a phytotoxicity. Uh, so just, if you wouldn't mind, I'm, probably there are people that have experienced a crop where they've applied a lot of insecticides and they've noticed unusual growth. Can you just raise your hand or type in some, uh, type in something about your experience? That would be, that would be great. Um, if you have some of those experiences. Okay. All right, we'll keep on going. So aphids, there is a pest management plan available and there are a lot of different products that are relatively low risk. Now, the reason here we've got some red products in red, the minor use permit 81707 is expiring next month. I just heard word from John McDonald who indicated that that permit is going to be renewed, which is great because it has a lot of different products that are low, um, low risk on it. I don't know if it's going to have the same number or if you need to get a new permit, but just keep that in mind. If you're using that permit, it's worth finding the new one when it's available. And at this point also, if you have specific questions about these pesticide, uh, these pest groups with regard to insecticides, please type them in and we'll try and address them straight away. Um, John, did we have any comments regarding this one with the phototoxicity? John, you might be on mute. No, I'm off mute, but uh, my mic is and head headset are still playing up, so I'm going to be a little bit disjointed, I think. <laughs> okay, I can hear you loud and clear. Yeah, I, yeah, it's just my my sight. I am that's um, having the problems apparently. Okay, all right. Um, okay, so uh, I'm just we did have reading one um, from Robert. Oh, you dropped out. I, I can see here there is. Okay, so there are a couple of um, a couple of comments here. So, have seen burnt new growth across the entire crop in some species. Um, there's a comment here about a cinnabaprid being a hundred times less toxic via contact. So. Th so it's worth being aware that yes, but different neonicotinoid products have different properties that may affect their environmental impact. Um, and there are ways of minimizing risk. Um, all right, and there's a comment about uh, Azimax that it is not only a contact product and has very limited beneficial impact. There's some information out there to indicate that some beneficials can be impacted. Um, uh, um, okay, we might we might end up summarising some of those in a follow up email. Where um, yeah, we'll we'll we'll. We'll, we might do some summarizing in an email following this. Thank you. All right. Um, however, Sorry, we man. have had um, an indication that Azimax is not a contact. All right. Um, that's so. If if that's that's the case, then apologies for for that information. Um, all right. So. For broad spectrum, 
aphid, pesticides. There are some. Now this biopesticide has popped up in my searches on a number of occasions for a number of groups. It's a specific strain and when I looked up that strain, it has been studied overseas and shown that it also affects a number of different insect and mite groups. So I've called it probably broad spectrum, um, but that's simply based on the strain that's on the label and the same strain being studied overseas in different research trials. I don't see any specific aphid questions. Um, have I missed anything, John? Mm. I'll keep going. No, I don't think so, Andrew. Thank you. I'll just respond right. to a few questions. Yeah. All right. So for leaf hoppers and plant hoppers, they're generally not too big of a need, too, too big of a problem for production nurseries. There aren't very many products available. Um, this is what I found. I think we'll keep on moving. Psyllids, there is a goal insect management plan which includes psyllids in the plan. They can be quite a challenging um, type of group of insects to manage. Worth being proactive. Again, we'll keep on moving along. For scale insects, what is worth knowing is that... Andrew? Yes, John. Um, uh, you dropped just out. Just with regards to Azamax, um, oh, yes. sorry, can you hear me now? I can. Um, just with regards to Azamax, um, uh, there's a con comment here that's saying that it is contact and has very little beneficial impact um, and it actually needs to be ingested. Mm -hmm. I guess the only issue there is that if you've got a predator which is actually consuming insects that have taken in the Azamax, is that then going to affect them in return because they're actually ingesting the chemical inadvertently? Mm. It's possible. Um, I guess there's also, uh, Azadiractin is not just only Azamax, there are another, a number of other trade names. And from what I understand, they are produced in different ways potentially. So that's also worth keeping in mind. Um, yep. Anyway. Scale insects. And I guess it goes for when Confidor yep. or I should say neonicotinoids first came out, they were deemed to be very safe. Yeah, I yep. think we're having issues with my mic, Andrew. <laughs> yep, that's okay. But All right. You keep going. Thank you. So, so what you want to keep in mind that is that scale insects are a group of insects that also include mealybugs. So if you have a pesticide registration that is for scale insects generally, you can use that against mealybugs legally, whether or not it actually has an effect. That's something that you want to keep in mind and keep track of. If you have a registration that's specifically for mealybugs, that doesn't mean that you can use it for all scale insects. Okay. There is a scale insect pest management plan available, and otherwise that's just a list. Um, you, you can refer back to this webinar when it goes online, goes online into the um, nursery YouTube channel, or you can do screenshots and whatnot. All right, stink bugs. There's a true bugs fact sheet, and otherwise, Really, this is just lists. Keep in mind that these registrations cannot be for specific groups. So it might be for mirrors or it might be specifically for Rutherglen bugs. I didn't want to get into too much specifics. So just check out your labels like you do for anything. 
check your label, make sure it applies for you in your situation. Okay, white flies, again, there's a pest management plan. There's, some, there's an, also a fact sheet. There's another fact sheet specifically on, on silver leaf white fly. I also, I think um, it would have been an older one. A lot of low risk products. Okay, more, more lists. Lists are largely uninteresting. So we're just gonna keep on moving. Beetle pesticides. Again, labels are highly varied with species or different groups. We do have a fact sheet available for scarab beetle larvae, for leaf beetles, and for borers. The boring, the insect borer fact sheet covers other groups besides beetles as well. Okay, just stop me, John, if there if there are comments that come up. Um, yeah, we're I'm almost done with this section. Okay, fungus gnats. So, so these are the pesticides that are available for fungus gnats, but I really want to stress for fungus gnats, if you can get your cultural practices right, and we'll talk a little bit more about cultural management generally uh, in the last section of a webinar, but for this group, get your watering down, put out biologicals, and it almost eliminates the need to put on insecticides, in synthetic, synthetic insecticides. I can't stress that enough. If you're overwatering, you're going to have you're, you're increasing your problem. Change your media if you need to, so that you can water less. There are ways of of managing fungus gnats so that you can don't have to rely on pesticides. Okay, thrips. Again, labels can be highly varied with species, and that's partly because of the insecticide resistance issues that are specific to certain species. But otherwise, this is just a list. Um, and we'll, we'll keep on moving. Okay, do we have um, any questions, John? We did have a comment with regards to strips um, talking about hypoaspis predatory mites mm -hmm. working well on, on the grower's property. Um, mm -hmm. And we are going to talk about beneficials shortly. Yes. Um, yes. So that's obviously helped that grower. Um, yes. And what else? Using. Uh, I'd had to be. Uh, Oh, they're yeah, using larvicide for fungus gnats, but yeah, found that they were had, having to reapply okay. the insecticides mm -hmm. to try and manage them. Yep. So, yep. Uh, yeah. Might just point out, sorry, I meant to do this at the, the beginning. We're using active ingredients to be more bipartisan. It's all because there are so many trade names with the same active ingredient. And it's worth keeping in mind that just because it has the same active ingredient doesn't necessarily w mean that it's as effective. There are different formulations. There are different um, uh, non-active ingredient components which can make a difference in efficacy. However, from our perspective, we didn't, we haven't done testing to say one is better than another, and so we're just sticking to the active ingredients. And there is one comment here by one of the participants with regards um, the different types of neonicotinoids. Uh, mm -hmm. There's a comment that um, acetamiprid is less toxic than imidacloprid, yet it's still mm -hmm. a banned product um, mm -hmm. with regards retailers. Um, yes. Are you able to expand on that as to why that's um, the case because I would have thought that yeah it's still a neonicotinoid and it's still going to get into the food chain mm -hmm. but being less toxic look yeah. I don't know the specifics of that research I'd have to look that up so for that to be the case I mean someone must have done some research and um, yeah, I, I'm not. I'm not sure about that specific information. Yep. No worries. Yep. All right. Well, we'll keep on 
keep on moving to this last section, which is about reducing our reliance on pesticides generally. And first, John, would you mind uh, launching our second poll? Uh, yep, just bear with me a minute. Here we go. Yep. It's coming up. Uh, it's coming up. <laughs> there we go. Um, so how do you know when you need to apply an insecticide? So just tick a box, hopefully only one, um, and we'll see how we go. Uh, so whether you have a consultant or a pest scout that finds your insect levels for you, um, whether you observe damage when staff are working in various activities, um, prophylactically spraying. So is there anybody out there that just sprays every Friday afternoon? regardless of what they find. Um, manage crop in other ways so you don't actually need to spray. And if there's any other methods that you use um, with applying insecticides. Um, and, and if you can actually summarize those if you do. Uh, it looks like most are using crop scouts or what their workers are actually observing in the, in the um, nursery. Mm -hmm. So I'll leave it for a couple more seconds. Uh, okay, we might close it off there and we'll share that. So most are relying on consultants or their own staff or themselves to actually look for or find insects in their crop, which is good mm -hmm. because part of the whole IPM thing is about monitoring and knowing what you've actually got. And if you don't know what you've got, why are you spraying? So there is still very low numbers that do prophylactically spray and they've obviously got their reasons for doing that as well. So no, that's good. It, it looks like we've got more than 100% probably because multiple answers are allowed. I'm assuming that that's the case. Yep. <laughs> it is. They're very active. All right. <laughs> yep. Okay. All right. We well, might just hide that and we'll head back to it. Thanks, John. All right. So this section on reducing pesticide usage or reliance on pesticides, it also doubles as managing insecticide resistance. Almost to all of these things, decrease the risk of insecticide resistance because it's reducing a reliance on pesticides. It makes sense. So the first thing, don't solely rely on pesticides. Make sure that when you do have to apply a pesticide, you know what the problem is and you choose an appropriate product. You make sure that your equipment's calibrated, that you have adequate spacing so that you can cover your plant and that you've put in place cultural management actions so that you are preventing insects, pests from entering the nursery and lowering your, your risk uh, of lowering your pest practice, <laughs> excuse me, lowering pest pressure passively. All right, and applying commercial predators. Um, would you just, if you apply, commercially available predators, can you please just raise your hand? That would be great and we'll... All right, yep, we do have a couple. Good, yep. All right, so when you're applying commercial predators, there are quite a few commercial um, biocontrol agent producers, the two largest ones being biological services and bugs for bugs. And if we have time at the end, we can jump to their websites and show that there are quite a few pest groups that you can purchase biocontrol agents to manage. What we would need to um, highlight is that pest populations, are, when you're using biologicals, you need to apply them when the pest populations are low and when environmental conditions are fav favorable. So by applying them early in the season, you can reduce the need, reduce pest pressure 
so that let's say in the middle of summer when perhaps you're not able to for environmental reasons, the pesticides, you're, you're having to apply fewer pesticides. I'd recommend that if you're going down this road, particularly if you're doing this for the first time, that you talk to your biological control agent producer. Make a plan on how you're going to do it. They would rather see you call them a number of times or lots and have you have a good experience with the products than for you to put them out and go, ah, it didn't work. Talk to them, get their experience because they're the experts with their products. All right. So you've gotten to the point you need to apply a product. Understand how that product works before you apply it. Is it a contact? Is it a translaminate? Is it systemic? Does it need to be ingested? Is it an immature growth regulator? So immature growth regulators, they act mainly on immature insects. So larvae, the nymphs of insects, some of these products don't kill the insect until they go to the next molt. That means that it might be a number of days or even a week or more, multiple weeks before the insect dies, even if it's hardly feeding at all. If you apply one of these products and you go out the next day and go, look, they're all still alive and kicking, um, then apply something else, well, maybe you've just wasted your time and money. Some of these products, if you apply them to the immature growth regulators, if you apply them to adults, they might make it so that they can't lay any more viable eggs. So it's worth understanding how these things work so that you know what to expect. Whereas your nerve poisons and your respiration active ingredients tend to be fast acting. And if we, again, if we have time, we can jump over to the Insecticide Resistance Action Committee website where this, I just snapped it from there. They, they categorize the different mode of action groups and tell you whether they are a nerve poison or a immature growth regulator or a, a respiratory or an ingestion. And so that can be quite helpful. Um, and then we also summarize some of this in the insecticide mode of action and resistance management nursery paper that came out a month or two ago. Okay, then also when you are applying these products, make sure you know when the, tar the target and target of the vulnerable life stage. There's no point in putting a pesticide on for large scarab larvae, or if you've got certain pesticides, the late instar larvae, the, the large larvae can be very resistant. So you often need to know what is the vulnerable stage and that often is before damage is vis visible. So you need to have a proactive plan. Know what your pests are, know when they are likely to be coming, write down your experience, record it so that you can be proactive in your management and that allows you then to apply pesticides in a more strategic way. Monitor. Uh, John and I, if you've been to any of our workshops, you know how much we go on about monitoring and recording your monitoring data electronically, particularly. So you mo when you monitor, it allows you to know when your pest populations are low. This means that you can manage the problem more easily have fewer plants damaged or fewer discarded plants. It also allows you to know when the predators are present and you can apply things to hot spots so that you don't have to apply as much product and you don't necessarily need to apply to the entire nursery. When you monitor before and after applications, even if it's just part of your normal weekly routine, it helps you work out what products have been effective. If you don't monitor and you apply your product, you, you don't necessarily know how effective it's been. You're just assuming based on whether or not there's damage, I suppose. All right. Cultural management strategies, as we've said, they're very important. They're passive, passive 
methods of reducing pest pressure. And we're not going to go into a lot of detail. We've the pest management plans that we've built are available online. These methods work, and it's important to realize that no one aspect here, no one point is more important than the others. It's about producing an umbrella. So each little, each point helps you have a better umbrella effectively to keep pests and pest pressure relatively low. So monitoring incoming stock, your resistant varieties, removing weeds, all of these things go to help you reduce the need to produce pesticides. I think we'll keep on moving. Encourage your natural enemies strategically. Now, that means avoid applying long residual, your broad spectrum products. And we're not saying don't ever apply them, but we're also saying if you're going to apply them, understand the impact on the nursery. If you apply a product which has a very long lasting residual effect, that tells you something about when you potentially could reapply uh, biologicals if that was what you wanted to do. Okay, companion cropping. Does anyone have banker plants or gardens that they use specifically for encouraging predators and natural enemies. This can work quite well. It's, it needs to be managed though, and we do have a fact sheet coming out later this year on managing these biological um, insects. You've got to monitor your refuge plants, make sure that you are producing parasites and predators and not pests. Otherwise, you're just multiplying your problem. And if you are having these plants in the growing area, you do need to replace them. Otherwise, it can be a method of reinfecting. Potentially, if you aren't managing them properly, you can potentially cause problems. All right, so that is actually all of the material we've got, and it's nearly 11. I'm sorry for some of our technical difficulties. Do we have any Final questions. Um, nothing as as such, Andrew. Um, okay. I think what you've supplied has been more than um, food for okay. thought for the the participants. Okay. All right. Um, I guess there was there is one one um, statement here from one of the participants that having a garden like I guess your banker plants near the office um, uh -huh. uh, to help identify what's in the area is probably could be I, more yes. of an attraction rather than having them scattered around because um, you're going to go past it every day and I know in a nursery situation you will have that mm -hmm. anyway with your workers going past things but yes. if, yeah, having a, a garden like Sentinel. that near the office yeah, would probably be a useful idea as well. And and that's it, it is a, something to keep in mind that there are crop lines that are more susceptible, they're high risk, and you can use those as sentinel type plants. You can devote more monitoring effort to those plants that are high risk, and that one keeps those plants, well, you're more likely to manage them proactively, and it also tells you something about the risk for the nursery overall. Absolutely. Yep. Okay. Now, is there any interest in jumping to any of the websites that we mentioned? Uh, that those being um, the Insecticide Resistance Action Committee or uh, Biological Services, Bugs for Bugs, the FMS website, or the side effects for BioCoPert and BioBest. If you just want to um, type any comments in, we can do that quickly or just Otherwise, raise your hand if you're interested yep but I suspect couple. okay um, one person has indicated the insecticide resistance okay so we'll just I'll just drag that over actually firstly what we're going to do is say thank you for attending 
Those of you who want to take off, absolutely do so. Thank you for attending. We're going to send a follow-up email with a survey. It'll probably be either this afternoon or tomorrow morning. So if you can do that survey, that's great. It helps us be able to sort of um, justify our existence to a certain extent and also helps us to understand the impact that these have for your business, which is the more important thing. All right, so thanks everyone. And stick around if you wanna go through some of these websites, otherwise we'll catch you next time. Okay, so okay. I'll rack one first out, Andrew. Yep. All right, okay. Um, okay. So this is the mode of action classification online. So there is a hard copy version, not a hard copy, but a version that you can print out it's in PDF form. So it's, it starts with one, it just goes down. And some of the things that are important here, you can hit the information button and it tells you a general statement about what it does. You also see that this is blue. So the blue stands for your nerve and muscle, and it tells you here that they are generally fast acting. Okay, so a lot of these products are blue. So neonicotinoids are 4A, and some of the, the technical jargon here is fairly intense. So you might want to just have a little search online. Method. Yes, but effectively, the, the the types of words that you need to keep in mind, okay, you ignore, oops, sorry, ignore the acetylcholine site on blah, 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 okay, causing a range of symptoms from hyper excitation to lethargy and paralysis. Okay, so these things are going to stop moving. And that tells you that if they're moving around, then they probably haven't been affected. And it's a nerve one, so it's generally it's fast acting. Whereas if we go further down, okay, green, juvenile hormone mimics. So again, it's a, it's a growth regulator. And it says here, generally slow to moderately slow acting. So it might, um, they can act in a various different ways on the growth. So it's applied to pre-metamorphic instar. So it's before they become adults and disrupt metamorphosis. So it prevents molting effectively. Some things here are gray, uh, gray being unknown or non-specific. So we don't know, that's where more, in, more information is needed. And here we go neonicotinoids and you can see the different products that are available, but not all of these are available for the production nursery industry. And we can go further down. Here we go, there's mid gut. These are your BT products. Um, so um, the ones that you use for fungus gnats and caterpillars. And it keeps on going down and there are a lot of different groups. Um, again, all right, so other information that is useful on this website, um, where pests, you can look at, just taking some time, different pests where insecticide resistance is an issue. The companion, this is an international website. If you want to have more specific information to Australia, you can head to Crop Life Australia, and that summarizes the information that is more specific to Australia and insecticide resistance, as well as herbicide and fungicide resistance. Okay. All right. If there aren't any other websites that people are interested in, we will probably end up sending some of these links out to you. You can look at them in your own time and we'll keep on going. Bill? All right. Well, I think that's about it, Andrew. <clears throat> Great. Um, 
I think we might call it there. Thanks everyone for attending. And like Andrew said, we will send out the links to these other websites that you can look at at your leisure anyway. So okay. thanks everyone for attending. Um, until our next webinar. Catch you all later. A few weeks time. Right. Okay. Bye. Yep.